morning. If you would turn to number 542, we'll sing this before we have a uh, prayer before class. <clears throat> number 542. Pure in heart, oh God, help me to be. May study your word and we pray heavenly father that we'll take your word serious in our lives and that we we will learn each day dear god and study some portion of your word to take it with us we pray heavenly father for those that are sick in this congregation and those that are unable to be here for whatever reason we pray that you'll be with them and we pray that they'll come back to us the next point in time we pray heavenly father for roger as he brings us this lesson this morning that we will together Look through the scriptures, dear God, and study in view of doing, uh, learning more about your words so we can do better. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all those we come in contact with. We pray that you will be with us as we have opportunity to seek out opportunities to study with someone that we come in contact with. We're thankful for the church, dear God, that meets here. We pray, Heavenly Father, you will be with us through these services, that we will pay attention to you, dear God, and come to worship you. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. No whining about the cold. It's going to be cold whether you like it or not, right? I was just sitting there thinking that if we were giving $500 to every person that would show up for Bible class today, they wouldn't care what the temperature was. Of course, they might not stay. For, they'd have to stay through the whole class. And then they'd have to give most of that back during worship for the contribution. They could keep part of it. Anyway, this humor never hurt anybody. We are studying authorized worship. In the first chapter, Clay gives three timeless principles about worship. What are they? What are the three timeless principles that are found in chapter one? Okay. 
Got a C object. What's the second one? Got your book. Okay. So in design and That's right. That's right. And the third one? He rejects unauthorized worship. The uh, <clears throat> when we talk about timeless principles, that has always been true. It always will be. When you think about God being the object of worship, I try to be careful about judging motives or hearts when I see things. Because I can't read minds. Sometimes we can read actions. But I think about some of these, these singing groups and it seems, I'm talking about spiritual songs, it seems like the attention is on how well they sing rather than the message. I'm going to tell you something. A sweet little old sister with, a, with laryngitis is just as sweet singing Amazing Grace as the best voice in the world. But, so, so God is the object. Why am I bringing that up? It's not about me. It's never to draw attention to myself. A lot of churches grow because they do things to draw people's attention, to get them in there. And it's okay. Sometimes we, we, we have a special day here at Adel and we'll invite people to stay and eat. That shouldn't be the drawing card. Now, I have brethren that argue about that and say, well, you have to start somewhere. That's true. But at any rate, if we can teach people that God is the object and the reason for salvation, and he's the object of worship, and that he is the one who defines worship, and if we can understand that, we won't have any trouble with point number three. We won't have any trouble with that. We, uh, I know Tony did a different class last week. So, you think about the, uh, on page, uh, page three is where I had noted for last week, but I was not here. And so, Clay gives the illustration. He said, I grew up with three siblings. Clay was the second out of our four. He said, our father worked in ministry and our mother stayed home. And Elisa would always make birthdays a special occasion. That's what they did in their home. Uh, and so she did that for our children. And, and Clay gives the illustration of you know, that mom would let us pick out a birthday dessert and a birthday meal. And he's giving the illustration, well, what if, what if Elisa just picked something she liked for their birthday? Would that be considerate? What if it's something they didn't even like? Now, I, I'm thinking... You know, when we were growing up, we ate what Mama put on the table, but we're talking about birthday here. I've had people uh, that I know buy a birthday present for their spouse because they liked it, but the spouse didn't really like it. And I think, you know, and Clay later gives illustration about the wedding, the engagement ring that Jessica wanted and how they considered that and God is the one we're trying to please. Worship helps me, but it's not about me. And that's one of the reasons most people are drawn to a lot of churches. Now, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of them, it's about the atmosphere they create to draw attention to themselves or to their actions. I think Ray Walker, 
He sang with the Jordanaires. He's the best song leader I've ever heard in my life. And I have, there's some videos of Ray on YouTube, and he'll, t this was back before cordless mics, and he'd take the microphone, and he would walk around the auditorium leading, singing, and he had a powerful voice. But Ray wasn't drawing attention to Ray. He was trying to get the congregation to sing. There's a difference in that standing on a stage doing a performance, isn't there? Yes. Big difference. And, and so we appreciate Tony and Steve for the effort they put out to lead us in worship and song. And we also teach through our singing, don't we? Yes. Whose, whose word are we teaching? God's message. A song needs to be scriptural in content, doesn't it? And so when you talk about God being the object of worship, and Clay gives the illustration about his mom fixing a meal that he would like for his birthday, we can understand that illustration. Um, she'll ask me what I want. I want to tell you this. I'm going to use it as an illustration. You know Elisa does not eat meat except for fish. And that's fine. But I do. And I like it. And she fixes it for me. She's fixed something in the crock pot, started cooking it last night. It's meat. I'm not sure what it is, but I know who it's for. And so, uh, good morning, brother. And so, why does she do that, Linda? Why does she do that? Because she wants to please you and herself. Right. And so, when it comes to worship, our aim and goal should be to please God. You remember two weeks ago, we looked at the example of Cain and Abel and how God accepted Abel's offering. He did not accept Cain's offering. Obviously because Cain did not offer with the right attitude and he didn't offer what God asked for. Jesus said in John 4 and verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I read that for a long time, Jason. Didn't know what it meant, but I think I do now. I think it means my attitude and involving myself. Could I, could I, let's, could, could a person get married and just make vows just because they had to make vows? Or could a person stand before the congregation, before they're baptized, and say they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but really not know what that means? It's, it's not valuable, is it? So singing, uh, it takes an effort, doesn't it, man? You have to think about the words. And it's probably hard for, for a song leader because he's involved in... But I tell you what, one of the things Brother Jackson taught us at Lipscomb about song leading, he says, look over your song list before you leave home. And you know what you're going to sing so you can worship too. And I thought that was good advice. Because we all, even if we're leading to worship... now. So you think about God being the object of worship. Jason, do you have one of these books on worship? Okay, we're, we're turning over to page four now. And so we, we're looking at worship aiming to please God. And I had last week, two weeks ago, I didn't do a bulletin last week. I intended to, but I had trouble with it. So I gave you a, a bulletin two weeks ago with... Uh, extra page in it on worship. Today, you're getting one with part two of that. It has two extra pages in it. And those are, I printed more so that Tony, I know, was giving some out at work and you could share them with somebody. Plus, what else is on there besides that article? Our meeting times, right? And so, but... Look at those articles and just keep those. Some people don't keep all their bulletins, but you might keep those. It, it will be a, a good help as we study worship. Brother Wayne Jackson does a thorough job with it. 
Let's look at Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Where's the best place to learn about what God wants? Does it frustrate you for somebody to start teaching something they don't even use the Bible or just kind of... All right. Lynn, you're up front. Read Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Okay. And so I'm not going to get involved in the word study here, word research. Clay uses the English Standard Version, and it says, let us offer to God acceptable worship. Um, Some words, depending on the context, can mean act of service. Sometimes they can mean worship. But I do know that acceptable service would include worship. Acceptable. Everything we do should be acceptable to God, to the best of our ability. Everything. And and that's my daily living too. And he, he gives the warning for our God is a consuming fire. You remember, uh, I know Clay gives the illustration of uh, Aaron's sons back over in Leviticus chapter 1. They offered up to God strange fire. And what they got fired from God and they were consumed. God is serious about what He expects for us to do. Let me ask you Is God eternal? Yes. He's self existent. But we started at some point in time, didn't we, Lynn? We're not asking for birthdays, but. Some of us were born on a certain day in a certain month in a certain year. You did not exist before that, but God always has been. And he made us. That alone says that God is worthy of worship his way. And he gave details in in Leviticus about how to worship in the tabernacle, how the priests were to conduct the worship and He's, he was specific about it and how it was to be done. And, and uh, Eli's sons were profane men and they, they caused serious trouble. And, but, you know, when Samuel was a boy, they were adults and they, they did terrible things, but it, but it had to do with worship. And Eli got on to them. And he said, well, what you're doing is not good. I thought, you could have come on a little stronger than that. Because God's going to. Yeah. Was he reprimanded later? Yeah, he was. That's right, he was. And they were committing fornication at the, t- at the tabernacle. <laughs> and, and taking advantage of taking the meat out of the sacrifice. And it's like, God is the author of worship. He's the one who designed it and expects us to do it his way, and no other way is acceptable. Yes, sir. I think they're not there to worship. Uh, ultimately, their failure to worship properly, their idolatry, was, a, was the main reason that they were taken away. That's right. They, and and they, they did worship idols. And, and, and Moses warned them in Deuteronomy chapter 30. What, what would happen to them. Now, if you look at God then, at the bottom of page, uh, well, let's see. Let's, let's look here at a couple of points. I think it makes a good point here. It's very easy, and I grew up understanding this, and I'll never say it was not good, being taught that worship in the New Testament, as far as the music is concerned, was without mechanical instruments of music accompanying the singing. 
There's no example of it in the New Testament. It's not taught in the New Testament. It's not even implied as a part of the worship of the church. And so I grew up knowing that if we added instrumental music to worship, we were adding something God did not ask for. I believe it's a sin to add something to worship that God didn't ask for. However, it's easy. And is that, I'm not asking you to say true or false. I, I already know what I, where I stand on it. I'm not being arrogant about it. I'm just telling people what the Bible says. But is it easy to focus on, well, we don't use instruments in our worship. But do I actively involve myself when I do? The Spirit, worship in spirit and in truth. Well, we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Fine. Do we seriously contemplate on the reason we're doing that? I mentioned this recently. If I wait on the table, which sometimes I do, may have two today, I'm going to take time back there and think about what I'm doing and not just serve it. I have to think about it too. And you all can just wait on us. We're waiting on you. But why are, we, why are we waiting on one another in the Lord's Supper? Communing with God, remembering what Jesus did and why he did it. This bread represents my body, which is for you. This blood is the new cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. That represents Christianity at its very foundation, brothers and sisters. The death of Christ, the blood of Christ, without which we'd be lost. We'd have no church. We'd have no hope. That memorial is precious. So I have to think about it. When I give, when I'm putting my, you know, if it's at home. Now let's face it, if you write a check every week, unless you change that figure, you just write out a number and you make sure you get here with it, Right? Do you think about why you're doing that? Well, wh why am I doing this? Well, because Steve's going to see how much I get. Uh. Is that the reason? No. no. Who really sees how much I get? Oh. And what's the purpose in giving? Other than what well, we're doing on the first day of the week because Paul said do it on the first day of the week. Wait a minute. Okay, fair enough, but what's the purpose? What's the greatest work in the world? The Lord's work. church. Evangelism right. The, church. the work of the Lord's church. The greatest message in the world is the gospel. Now, the greatest workers in the world are not necessarily preachers. Some of the greatest workers, people don't even know what they're doing. Like, you may go visit in the hospital. Nobody sees you but that person and the Lord, but you're doing the Lord's work, and that's great, isn't it? That's wonderful. But the greatest work in the world in many ways takes money. I am working on trying to get um, somehow to get our brother in Nicaragua, maybe on a Sunday evening, to get him live and get him through these TVs somehow so we can have a chat with him. You've never seen him. I'll need an interpreter. I can interpret, but for some reason I have trouble interpreting for him. It's, he has country Spanish, if that makes any sense. But at any rate, why do we send money to Javier Nunez? What's he doing? He's the He is the ring leader in that little church down there and I tell you what, they have a hard time. They've had neighbors complain because they're meeting in a house and they don't want to hear those people singing. Now you think, you know, be thankful for your building. But, but what we send it to him because he's helping people know the Lord. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right oh, that's right. He just, he's getting over dengue fever, D -E -N -G -U -E. I think he's doing better. I, he had sent me a message on the sixth, but I didn't see it till like Friday. But yeah, he's been sick, 
but he works alone. And uh, we just gave him, what is it, $20 raise? Was it 10? $10 raise. So anyway, we do that because the people in his world in Nicaragua need what he has to share. And that little church needs him. And so the point of our giving is to help do the greatest work in the world. What about prayer? You know what? I remember when Paul Hicks, he's dead now. He lived to be close to 100, I think. But uh, he took some of us boys back when we were teenagers in Chattanooga, and he did what they call a training class for song leaders. Paul was a song leader. He was good. And, uh, he, but he also would teach us to, to lead prayer. But I remember my voice was changing, Linda. And I was trying to sing, what is that? When peace like a river. Let, always advise a boy whose voice is changing not to lead that song because he'll go all over the charts. But, but he taught us to do that. And then they taught us how to pray. You remember the first time you led a public prayer and it make you nervous? Remember this, you're not talking to this church, you're talking to God. And he doesn't care whether you're nervous or not. He just wants you to do your best, right? Worship is about God. And uh, at any rate, so we come back here to, to page four. God defines and designs, God designs and defines worship. And we, we know, look in Leviticus, um, notice somebody, if you would, uh, read that little text there on page, uh, page five from, from the book, you know, or read from your own Bible, whichever, Leviticus 1, 10 to 13. So God was fairly specific here, wasn't he? Let me share something with you. Look at Genesis 4 and verse 4 and compare what Abel did with what is written here. I want to talk about that just very briefly. Look at Genesis 4, 4. somebody gets there, just read it, please. Just hold your hand up so we'll know who it is. Stay faster than you, Tony. <laughs> Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his own. And their fat portions. Now look at Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 12. Right there, either in your Bible or in your book. You might want to make a note of that and get your marginal note. What am I seeing here? The fat. The fat. Both times. I am convinced, even though we don't have the written instruction, detail by detail, that basically Abel did what God always wanted done. And he just got more detail with it when the law of Moses was established. An animal blood sacrifice is all that God would ever accept for sin. And that may have been the blight on Cain. He didn't offer that. And the ultimate blood sacrifice was Jesus' blood. And 
So God was specific here, and he meant what he said. Now, we're not under that law, and I'm glad we don't have to do that. And I'm glad that Jesus took care of it for us one time and he didn't have to go through it again. But I need to appreciate by remembering what God did, not just through the Lord's Supper, right, Jason? Not just through the Lord's Supper, but every day. That God gives me another day to live for him and love him and and have the forgiveness of sins when I confess my sins and you can't put a price on that but that's worship worship is prayer if it's done correctly so if we look back at, look here at the bottom of page 5 if we look back at the book of Exodus we may gain a little insight into this specific, specific specificity I can't say it say it Lisa specificity specificity I knew a girl of that name one time. Specificity. Exodus is about more than the children of Israel escaping from Egypt. The latter half of the book describes the process by which God ordained the design and construction of the tabernacle. Were those were the, the detail were there details for the tabernacle? Ages and ages. Were there details for the priests' attire? Were there certain days for certain feasts and certain, uh, and of course now, we don't have that like that now, except the first day of the week. I have to be careful because I'm not God. I know you know that. But you just have to wonder what people are thinking about that, read about Jesus' death. They appreciate what Jesus did. They understand to some degree what crucifixion was. They've been taught that the Lord's Supper is a representation of his body and his blood. And, but for some reason, they don't have time to honor God about that. Something's wrong. If I don't have time to honor my God for what he did, I don't even need to call his name. I just need to forget about him and be at least a practical atheist. Let's, let's face it. It's not a hard thing to do. Really. And, and have you ever come to worship God and not gone away feeling blessed in one way or another? Yeah, I mean, it's it's designed to honor God, but it blesses us. Yes, sir? You, you just mentioned it's not hard to do. Again, look at the work involved in the preparation involved in the Old Covenant. That, that, that was an arduous task. And look at the pr preparation that was done to make it possible for us to be here. And it's not, I mean, you know, Jesus in Luke 9, 23 says, Take up your cross daily. Because he was going to take it up and take care of it. My cross is not nearly what his was. Not nearly what his was. And his he had to take it because you and I sinned. And so it's just a lack of appreciation for God that people that don't have time to worship him. It's either a lack of understanding, maybe they've never been taught, or they just don't care. Well, if we love God, we care. I can come in here on some Sundays and do a better job at worship than others. Did I really focus on this? Lord, I'm sorry. I, I didn't do as well with that today. You're not going to do it perfectly. But what's your aim? To try, right? And... and I mean, let's face it, how many of us would even be here if it were not for the grace and the mercy of God? We would have no God, no Jesus to talk about. Now, you know, the, uh, so Clay goes on to say that before, back bottom page five, 
last paragraph, even before that, one of the book's themes is the presence of God among his people. During the escape from Egypt into the wilderness, God led the children of Israel by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, cloud in the daytime, fire at night, Exodus 13, 21 to 22. After the people made the golden calf, God told Moses to go into the promised land and an angel would lead the people, but added, I will not go up among you. I'm on page six. Lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Why did God say that? Because they had turned to the gods of Egypt and had Aaron make one out of their gold jewelry and, and then Moses confronts him with it and said, well, the people asked for it and I put this gold in here and out came this calf. I thought, that's the silliest thing I ever heard in my life. A grown man stand there and say something like that. Wasn't that Aaron? It was Aaron. Yeah. Who did I say? Moses. Well, said Moses confronted Aaron. Oh, really? Aaron's response was. And so, so but, but God was not happy. He's not happy with our idolatry at any level. Don't, let's move out of the assembly for just a moment and be careful what I put before God. And even though Exodus 20 is for the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel, the principle is still true. You shall have no other gods before me. That's any time, anywhere, any day. And so we have to be careful what we pay homage to. Steve, you owe, uh, you owe it to go to work because those people pay you. And Tony and those who are retired, just be happy about that, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, Jason has to go to work. Elisa has to go to work. I have to work. And I owe it to the church to do what? The church needs because I get paid to do it. And so so I should do that not just because I get paid, but because God wants me to honor my commitments. Now that's not worship, but it certainly honors God, doesn't it, Sandy? To do that. Yes, sir. After that molten calf incident, we'll see how serious God is about such things. How many people died by the sword that day? I don't remember. It was a lot, and 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 so, mm -hmm. why is it that people don't don't read the Old Testament and see that they can't do just what they want to do in worship today and think God's going to honor them on the day of judgment? We may have very few people if we follow the Bible, but I'd rather be the few that are faithful than the many that are lost. I'd rather be a few of the faithful. I don't know what people's problem is, but I do. One way or another, there's a lack of love and honor for God. And it's sad because they're not going to go to heaven. Now, <clears throat> Clay gives the illustration about the chili. You know, um, yes, ma'am. Thank you for that, yeah. I had it highlighted in my Kindle, but read that again. The rituals in Leviticus provide the means by which a holy God dwells well among an unholy people. you got to let that one sink in, haven't you? Think about it. Is, does, is God absolutely holy? John says in 1 John 1, verse 5, that in him is, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is absolutely holy. He cannot be tempted, James tells us. But he wants to dwell among his people. Those rituals made it possible for God to dwell among his people. Now, carry that, up, carry that forward 
few thousand years. What makes it possible for God to dwell with us? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. And that he washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 and verse 5. And so we walk in the light as he is in the light and the what? Blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 verse 7. So those, sac those sacrifices made it possible for God to dwell among those people. But God dwells within us. Whether you understand that, I don't have to understand that. I just believe it. How he dwells in me, I don't have to understand it. I just believe it. It doesn't mean I work miracles. It doesn't make me a little God. But he dwells in the church because of the blood of Christ. So Clay gives an illustration about chili. I have never eaten northern food. Anything north of well, I take that back. I ate in St. Louis one time, and they were talking about food, and I didn't. Chicken Kiev, I thought, what in the world? Well, it's from Russia, I think. But that's about as northern food that I'd ever had, and it was pretty good. But they didn't cook like my grandma Austin did or my mama. Grandma's and mom, mama's chicken was different. So, you know, how you fix chicken or chili, Clay gives illustration about chili. He says uh, Kentucky chili is spaghetti. I thought, well, then it ain't chili. <laughs> it isn't to us. But then some people say that real chili doesn't have any beans in it. I thought, mine does, and it's real. But what's his point? Not all chili's the same. But, but he makes the point, he said, you know, I suppose, he said, if we were able to find one, the person who created chili, I suppose they would have the right to say what qualifies as chili and what, what does not. The illustration sheds light on the discussion of worship because God is the object of worship. He instituted it. He has the authority to say what is worship and what is not. You can do that with food, you know. Y'all try something different now and then. But don't do that with worship. Now, let me throw this in here before the clock gets us. Do we have to have the collection for the saints, a collection right after the Lord's Supper? Not necessarily. Could we do it? Could we have the Lord's Supper before preaching? Yes. And do the collection later. Say, so if you like the sermon, pay us. I'm joking, I'm joking. But seriously, you know, I mean, there, the Bible does not give us an order. I do believe there's an order for the Lord's Supper. Jesus took the bread and the fruit of the vine. But where it fits in the worship, we're not told. You know why some people say y'all have the Lord's Supper after preaching? In case some sinner comes forward, then they have the right to take the Lord's Supper. I figured there's a bunch of them taking it. shouldn't take it in the first place, but that's between them and God. But I understand that point. But you don't have to do that, do you? How many songs should we sing, Lynn? Well, all, I don't, all you have to sing at least one, right? Do you have to have a song and a prayer before class? No. It's a tradition. But we do it because we like it. And so it's a good thing to pray, but I tell you what, teachers, you ought to pray before you couldn't get up here. Talk to God about it. That's worship. Now, I figured I figured I would have finished this. It was going to go into chapter 4 today, but I figured wrong. Oh, chapter 2, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Help, help me to worship you acceptably today. Yeah. Well, you'd 
have to get up early enough to do that. And you'd have to, you know what I'd have to do, Tony? I'd have to make myself a note and put it on the mirror. And then I'd get used to it, wouldn't I? Well, would be anything wrong with that? Pray before you go to worship today. Eventually, it'd just become a life habit. I guess we'll pick up with page, let's pick up on page six next time. Well, next Sunday be the 28th, 28th. All right.